For a lot of my projects, I use inkjet printed elements, either as designs on their own for things like decals, or combined with other modelling techniques, as I did with the signs for my level crossing lights. Here the print is very much centre stage, less so on my directional loco lights, where I use printed acetate for the head code frames on my Lima Class 33. In those project videos, I tend to skip on one thing, only lightly touching on the layout design. But here, in response to some of the comments on my decals video, I want to share how it's done in a little more detail. And for this, I'll be using Microsoft PowerPoint, hopefully to make it as relevant to as many people as possible. Of the many programs out there, I usually use Adobe InDesign, which is perfectly suited for the job, but it is expensive. I've tried out some of the free ones, but none seem to have the flexibility or the accuracy we're looking for. So I've gone for what might seem the slightly odd choice of PowerPoint, mainly because as part of Microsoft Office, many people will have it bundled with the ever popular Word. But even though it's primarily a presentation program, it actually does everything we need. And I'm going to start my guide by opening a new document. First, we need to change the page setup from a screen presentation to an A4 sheet for printing and select the orientation we want. The option of scaling up or down doesn't really matter because we're going to get rid of those elements anyway, just hitting delete on the keyboard. Then we can save our empty document. Now, I am using a Mac and the interface looks a bit different on Windows, but the operation is much the same. Just find a destination folder and give it a suitable name. For my demo, I'm going to create a sheet of decals using a variety of design techniques to show what can be done, starting with importing a pre-existing image, a JPEG of my Pater Practicus logo, which I've copied over to my project folder. This appears bang in the middle of my layout. PowerPoint, trying to be helpful, offers some scaling options in the designer pane, which we can ignore and close by clicking the X, instead scaling it ourselves by dragging one of the corners and moving it to where we want it. When an object is active, we also get some format info in the top bar, along with the option of opening the format pane. This is invaluable for accurate positioning as we can enter our own values into the various fields. And as well as the coordinates for the top left hand corner, we can specify the size. The aspect ratio being locked by default, which most of the time is exactly what we want. Now let's make everything a bit easier to see using the slider in the bottom right. Then we can make a duplicate of our image. The easiest way being to hold down the control key and simply drag the object. The coordinates shown alongside helping us to line it up. This is made even easier if we also hold down the shift key, which locks the object's position in one of the axes, so we can only move it left and right. Then we can finalize the position using PowerPoint Spark Guides, although they can't always decide which thing takes priority. And if you want absolute precision, best to use the format pane. We can also select several things at the same time, just dragging our mouse over the objects, then duplicating them all together in exactly the same way. So far, we've just been laying out something created elsewhere. So now let's get on with some actual design using PowerPoint, starting by adding some type. And for this, we'll need a text box, the tool for which we find in the top bar. This will start where we click on the layout and grow as we type. Now we want to select a font, and we've got a drop down menu of the myriad of typefaces available. Fortunately, I don't have to scroll very far for the one I want. Then we can set the type size, either using the drop down or typing directly in the field. That done, we can move our box where we want it. Now we want to set the line spacing or the leading, which PowerPoint makes unnecessarily complicated, giving us only very basic alternatives in the drop down. None of these are what we want. But hidden away in line spacing options, there's a place where we can set the point size exactly. And I reckon I want my leading the same as the type size, or solid as it's known typographically. But with my text lined up to the round all, I think I could go a little bit tighter. So back into line spacing options for a bit of a tweak. Then happy with the size and spacing of my lockup, I can select the two items together and duplicate the combined unit, just like before. So far, PowerPoint has been behaving pretty much like any other page layout program. We can select objects either separately or together and group them if we want. But here's something peculiar and quite annoying. Unlike other programs where we can scale multiple items together as a group, PowerPoint will do images but not type. And even constraining proportions by holding down the shift key only applies to images. But rather than changing all the type sizes and the leading manually, I've got a workaround, starting with copying the grouped objects. Then back to the edit menu for the paste special, giving us a variety of options. In this case I chose PNG, but I've since worked out that PDF gives us better results. But either way we've now got a scalable object, one that we can move around or even duplicate if we want. But what we can't do is ungroup it or edit any of the type. For that we'd have to go back to our original 
and repeat the process. I'm going to get on to designing with shapes in a bit, but first I want to look at another source for ready-made graphics, the internet. And it's from there that I downloaded this 1960s BEA logo for a speculative livery on an Airfix Rotodyne. And I'm going to recreate part of the decal sheet I made for that here, starting with the big logos for the wings, typing the size I want into the picture format pane, and making a duplicate in the now familiar way. Then I want another copy which I can resize for the tail fins, again typing the dimensions in the format pane, and duplicating for the other side, using the smart guides to keep everything tidy. Then exactly the same procedure for the four logos on the fuselage, resizing first, then duplicating, until we've got a complete set. Now for the Union flags for the front of the plane, and even at risk of repetition there is something I want to demonstrate here. My flag graphics got a drop shadow, which obviously I don't want to print. I could easily find another one, but let's stick with it here, so we can see the crop tool in action. As with the format pane, the button only appears when the image is active, and when pressed we get some extra handles on our frame, which we can drag until we've just got the bit we want. And we can move our new cropped image to where we want it, and resize in the normal way, either dragging the corners or using the format pane. Note that the size and dimension are that of the new crop, not the original image, so they are what you see. Now, while I pull together some type panels for either side of the Rotodyne, let me take this chance to plug some of my other decal videos. I'll put in some links at the end. And of course, don't forget to subscribe for more of my projects, modelling or otherwise. Now that's out of the way, let's crack on with this one, with a very quick look at importing vector graphics. Unlike the JPEG and PNGs, my image uses algorithms to define its shape and colours, rather than pixels. And even though our BEA logo is fine at this scale, it would start to look blurry if it was much bigger. Our SO vector graphic isn't limited by resolution. The math's recalculating whatever size it is, so it'll always be completely clear. The difference isn't that evident here, but given a choice, go for the vector. Now let's start making some shapes of our own. And for this we need to go to the shape selection menu. There's loads of things in there, but let's kick off with a simple rectangle, dragging it out from the corner and pulling it around with the anchor points. My shape came by default with a blue background and a black outline, both of which can be changed in the toolbar, either choosing something from the colour picker or nothing at all. We've also got some extra things in the drop down under more fill colours, and particularly useful is the eyedropper tool, with which we can match the colour of our shape to something else in the document. But let's get rid of that and go and create something properly. I'm going to make a round all, starting with a circular shape, making sure it's perfectly round by holding down the shift key. Unlike our graphic, the aspect ratio isn't locked by default, but we can do that by checking this box, which will also be reflected in the format pane. Now when we change the size, we'll keep our circularity. This time we don't want to get rid of the stroke, we just want to change the colour, clicking on a suitable swatch in the picker. Then we can make it wider, adjusting the weight further down in the same menu. We can change the background or the fill in exactly the same way. One thing to notice here is that when we duplicate the item, as well as obviously having the same colours for the stroke and fill, it still has its aspect ratio locked, making it really easy to scale, and using the smart guides easy to move into the right place, where we can change the colours of the stroke and fill. For my demo, I'm just using the standard swatch colours, and my measurements are all very approximate, but with a bit of research it will be easy to get them right, with the correct colour breakdown searchable on the internet, along with the dimensions for your particular application. Now I want to make some variations, and for this I need to group both of my objects and scale them together, holding down the shift key to preserve the aspect ratio. Then I can make a copy of my group, for a second smaller roundel. We can do the same thing with rectangles, dragging out the shape we want, again holding down the shift key if we want a square, removing the outline if we don't want one, and changing the colour. Once again I'm being very rough and ready with my measurements, in order to demonstrate as quickly as possible. And the thing I want to show here is the eyedropper tool in action, picking up the same blue as in our roundel, and applying to the rectangle. Now let's look at something else you can do with groups. When I scale my roundel I hold down the shift to preserve the aspect ratio, but you can also lock it in the format pane, making for easy and accurate scaling, and those settings will be carried across when you duplicate. Now there is one thing I need to go back to. When I scaled my roundel the size of the circles reduced in proportion, but not the thickness of the stroke. That stayed at 3 point, so I need to go in and adjust that manually for both outlines on both roundels. There's probably a place where you can lock that as well. And of course, using a group of four circles without outlines would solve the problem too. 
This was completely avoided with my wing decals, created in much the same way. Now we want to try and fill up our A4 sheet, and we can be clever about how we organise stuff. A group duplicate set of my roundels can be rotated Tetris style, and with a little bit of adjustment, tucked in to make the most of our relatively expensive paper. Also addressing the fact that I forgot to flip one of my tail fin blazes when I made my first set. Now I've got a little bit of space left at the bottom of my sheet, so I thought I'd do one final graphic, a triangular warning sign, running through once again what we've learnt so far, but also adding a few extra bits. We already know how to set the colour of the background and the width of the outline, but we could also set the shape of the join, in this case selecting round from the options in the format pane. We also know how to set up a text box, adding type for our particular hazard, but for the font we can just start typing the name of the typeface, which is often quicker than scrolling through the entire menu. And if we want it centred rather than left aligned, that's really easy too. We've also seen how to select more than one thing and group them together either to scale as a single unit, or as with type, copy as a group, and use the special paste to make something that can be scaled, without the type going all weird. Right back near the beginning we also found a convenient way of duplicating things, using the control and shift keys, and how to scale proportionally, either holding down shift, or locking the aspect ratio in the format pane. But of course we've only scratched the surface, and there's loads more that we can do with PowerPoint although lots of those things are very much presentation focused. Animations and transitions won't be much use to us here. But I hope I've been through enough to give a really solid foundation, and we can finish up by printing our sheet, double checking the paper size and print orientation in the page setup. Then to the print menu, and depending on what options you are given, choose the best quality and media to suit your decal sheet, then wait for the printer to do its thing. And there we have it, an A4 sheet of assorted graphics ready to be applied as decals, designed using, of all things, Microsoft PowerPoint. To see how to apply them, you'll have to watch one of my other videos, where I look at both inkjet and laser printed decals, investigating the pros and cons of each.